It's clear that the tabling of this motion has already produced some kind of result, although we can't tell yet what precisely is going on. According to today's media, we now have the promise of some kind of fuel allowance increase. The Minister of Finance and Minister Gormley, though, are a total disarray on the issue. Mr. Lenin, Minister Lenehan opposes an increase in the fuel allowance. Minister Gormley is out talking up an increase. And the Minister responsible, Minister O'Queeve, is saying nothing. At a time when Minister Gormley is looking for consensus from the rest of us, we find the government parties are squabbling among themselves on this issue. It would be funny, except for the fact that it is tragic for those directly affected. This debate today has prodded a response, albeit a muddled one, from the government, but it's worth noting that there is nothing in the government amendment to clarify the matter. Recently, at my request, the Joint Oireachtas Committee on Community Energy, or, sorry, Communications, Energy and Natural Resources held hearings on the issue of debt management and the high level of disconnections, which is a matter of concern to the regulator and the utility companies. It's clear that organisations like MABS and the Vincent de Paul play a vital role in supporting people at risk, and I want to record our thanks for their dedication. It's also clear that the government has no overarching strategy in place to deal with fuel poverty. So I'm asking the Minister to outline his proposals for a strategy when he responds in this debate. Two years ago, the Labour Party foresaw the growing problem and we published uh, legislation. In 2008, we took action and published the Fuel Poverty and Energy Conservation Bill. The purpose of the bill is to require the Minister for Communications, Energy and Natural Resources to publish and implement a strategy for reducing fuel poverty. The Minister would then be responsible for setting targets for the implementation of that strategy. Regrettably, the Government ignored the bill then. Now I'm asking that in the absence of any statutory initiative that the Government take up our proposal. In Northern Ireland, the situation is markedly different. A fuel poverty strategy is in place. It includes a zero disconnection policy, which we argue could and should be adopted here in the Republic. It's based on the use of prepaid meters so that people can only use what they can afford. The regulator here has approved the use of additional 17,000 free prepaid meters this year, and that is welcome. The cost of these meters is prohibitive, but this measure does not go far enough. In Britain, the government has a legal obligation to eradicate fuel poverty. In Northern Ireland, the strategy sets out targets that have to be met by 2016. Isn't it time here in the Republic that we live up to the challenge at home? Thousands of households in Ireland won't be able to afford heat and power in their homes this winter. Winter mortality deaths of approximately 2,000, mostly older people, are recorded each year in Ireland alone due to the weather and cold. One of these, this is one of the highest levels in the EU. The rise in the number of fuel poor is likely to put more lives at risk this winter. Many families with young children are forced to choose between heating their homes or cooking a hot meal. Fuel poor people are living in cold, damp, energy inefficient housing and are often unable to heat their homes to an adequate level. Fuel poverty is defined as the need to spend greater than 10% of the household income on fuel to achieve an acceptable level of warmth. It depends on household income, the energy efficiency status of the property, the cost of energy. So all these factors that are interlinked need to be tackled. But we don't even have full information. At present, there is no comprehensive, up-to-date national statistics available on the number of people experiencing fuel poverty in Ireland. But it is noteworthy that recently, uh, research carried out by Anbord Gosh on a sample of 500 household disconnections revealed a new demographic when it comes to fuel poverty. 59% of the households that were disconnected were owner-occupied. Only 2% were in social housing. Overcome by unemployment, high mortgages, family breakdown or illness, these are the new poor who live in private estates and live in terror waiting for the company man to come and disconnect an essential household service. In one case I know of, a woman is desperate for help. 
Her husband is self-employed and recently suffered a brain injury and can't work. They have a young child. When the woman sought help from her community welfare officer to pay for heating oil, the CWO told her that no assistance could be given for oil fills. So what is this woman to do? What are all the other women like her who regularly come to our clinics, mothers with young children or older people with long-term medical conditions? It has been estimated that around 60,000 Irish households live in persistent fuel poverty and a further 160,000 or so experience intermittent fuel poverty. According to the ESB, approximately 10,000 customers a month are agreeing to a payment plan to cover their bills. That is approximately 90,000 so far this year. And Board Gosh has stated that of the order of 20,000 customers are currently carrying arrears of more than 500 euro and that 20,000 customers are in the final resolution stage where disconnection of supply is a possibility. I have to say among all the statistics, the most shocking one for me is the fact that debt management in and board gosh Aaron is, at a 40 is now a 40 times bigger problem this year in 2010 than it was last year in 2009. It is 40 times bigger. I think that shows the scale of what we are now uh, uh, going to have to deal with. And we do know certain uh, approaches that will help. Early intervention is key to finding the solution and new payment plans must be offered to all those customers who are struggling to pay their bills. All utility companies must have an active role in ensuring that customers are facilitated in paying in methods that they can manage. I mean, for example, the ESB is now saying to post office um, customers that they have to pay in quantities of 20 euro uh, rather than the small amounts that they've been paying up until now, that that has been mooted. I don't think that is helpful. I have to say, and I hope that they um, adopt a, a different approach. But that said, I think it is worth, worth noting that the companies in the main are making considerable efforts to assist customers in trouble. It's not helpful that the uh, regulator, the, the Commission for Energy Regulation, has set the price for disconnection and reconnection fees at around 200 euro. This bears no relation to either the cost of these measures nor the ability of the debtor to pay it. So there needs to be a full review in the context of developing towards a zero disconnection policy that these fees are made manageable. And it's curious that the regulator who's so exercised with ensuring competition in the market has not dealt with a lack of competition in the free electricity units markets. market. At present, only ESB customers are entitled to free units. This is obviously part of uh, social welfare support. But other utility companies are only allowed to offer cash or check alternatives. And understandably, free units are by far more preferable to customers. It may seem like a small point, but the scheme should be redesigned to extend their availability to non-ESB customers. The government maintained that prices have gone down. But if we look back far enough, 2002 we had among the lowest prices in, in the EU for electricity. Now we're on the higher end of that range. Before full deregulation, and that is something that is now being considered by the regulator, uh, and I, I hope it will be helpful to customers, but it seems to me extraordinary that before we can have full deregulation for households, there will be further costs leveled, leveled in the interests of competition. The regulator is insisting that the major utility companies must change their brand names if they are to have price deregulation at an early date. At the committee, the regulator was asked, OK, how much is this going to cost? And I was rather startled to hear that the regulator didn't know how much it was going to cost, even though he was imposing this requirement on the major utility companies. It's not his problem, it seems. No. It's our problem. We are the consumers who are being sacrificed on the altar of competition. It is a crazy plan that Labour opposes strenuously. 
Such a change, and indeed a loss of familiar brand names that I think in this country we can take a certain pride in, the SB and our board, gosh, but such a change where those names would be lost and a whole campaign would have to be uh, designed to um, explain this to the customers and get them used to a new um, name, a set of names, it will cost at least 80 million. And Borg Gosh have already estimated it will cost 40 million. The ESB is a much bigger company, it will cost more. If you look at what Aviva spent in changing their name, it's actually quite uh, mind boggling. And who actually will pay for this bling regulatory measure? The unfortunate co consumer will be forced to foot the bill. In the interest of common sense, I'm now asking Minister Ryan, who I think is a man of common sense, to step in and push a stop to this uh, vagary once and for all. We simply cannot afford it. There is a, a, a context to the whole issue of how we manage energy, how we price energy, uh, and how we use energy. And there's an onus on any government to deal with fuel costs and climate change in a fair and equitable way. And it is a matter of regret that tackling climate change for many people is now perceived simply about the imposition of a carbon levy. And I'm talking about the public perception that it is seen as a negative. When in fact tackling climate change is the responsibility of all of us and the government can be a help or a hindrance in helping us to, to face up to it. And that's why it's disappointing that a Green Party minister has failed to deliver fully on energy efficiency measures. There is a plethora of energy efficiency schemes, but there's no comprehensive national retrofit effort that could transform Ireland's energy efficiency and play its part in uh, tackling energy or fuel uh, poverty. At present, most grant, aids, grant support for energy efficiency measures is geared towards those with disposable income who can afford to make up the cost of the solar panel or have the space for a wood pellet burner. Private companies are springing up, and good luck to them, to provide renewables for, households, for these households. And they're clearly targeting the better off who can avail of these grants. And there is now the warmer home scheme. And I'm glad of that. It's geared towards providing insulation for elderly people on low incomes living in, in poor quality housing. But it's, it's limited in its range. You have to have, certainly in my area, and I think that applies all over the country, you have to have a fuel allowance before you can actually qualify for the scheme. So it means that the scheme excludes as many as it includes. The fact is very often those on low incomes are still living in poorly insulated, substandard, energy inefficient homes. In a recent survey among homeowners who took part in the Home Energy Savings Scheme carried out by Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland, it found that single and low income households are underrepresented as are younger adults and those in rented accommodation, end of quote. And the reality is that in effect, poor householders are means tested for basic insulation projects, while the better off are entitled to claim for grants for the various uh, energy efficiency measures. But even allowing for this startless, startling unfairness, Minister Ryan failed to ensure that the funding allocated for energy efficiency actually got spent last year. This was budgeted, it was allocated, it was in the estimates, uh, and around 35 million euro were actually returned into the maw of the Minister for Finance because Minister Ryan couldn't implement his own policy. And you know, you look at other commitments that have been made in the programme for government to maximise energy efficiency with a target of 33% energy savings by 2020 in the public sector. That has tremendous potential for job creation. And in fact, we in the Labour Party produced a document, the Energy Revolution, putting forward very clear proposals on a national energy efficiency retrofit programme to create at least 30,000 direct construction sector jobs. We recognise the need for an immediate jobs initiative. And these schemes, this particular project of retrofitting, is the low-hanging fruit in relation to job growth and energy savings. This summer, during the Oireachtas Committee meeting, when I questioned Minister Ryan on his failure to deliver, he asked me what I would do differently, and I told him. I said, first, I would concentrate on houses for which there is greatest need, 
I certainly would invest in insulation in public buildings such as schools and hospitals. Every hospital should be covered with external insulation. That should be the government's marker if it's serious about insulation and increasing energy efficiency." End of quote. And I have to say, and I'm glad the Minister agreed with me, but there is no major programme for insulation for our schools, hospitals, guard stations and public buildings, even though there are thousands of construction workers with the necessary skills and without work.